Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, people may join us later. Um, but uh, to everyone who is already on the line, good morning. Um, thanks for joining our webinar on creating products using more sustainable wet processing techniques. Uh, my name is Ariel Creighton. I'm a senior consultant with MadeBy. Um, and I'll be uh, walking you through this topic for the next hour. Um, bear with me just a moment. Okay, so the agenda for the next hour looks roughly like this. Um, we're going to spend um, a little bit of time looking at wet processing and what some of the issues are. Then we'll spend um, a few minutes um, diving into some of the more interesting topics. Um, we'll look at uh, advanced denim, we'll look at lower impact cellulosic dyes, we'll look at waterless dyeing uh, and solution dyeing. And then we'll have some time at the end for some uh, Q&A as well. And I'm going to briefly um, talk about SCAP. I think everybody um, on the call is, is quite familiar um, with the project. Uh, made by has been on the SCAP steering committee and the metric working group uh, since it began and we've been directly involved in the development of the SCAP footprint calculator. Um, but just to kind of recap, uh, the um, SCAP 2020 commitment is all about reducing carbon, water and waste and taking specific actions to achieve those reductions and reporting on the impact. So the goal today is really to give more information about new fabric dyeing, which is metric number 10, and to give you some ideas that hopefully you can take away and start implementing yourselves. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of some of the uh, brands and organizations who are members and signatories of SCAP. So this includes brands, NGOs, charities, uh, certification bodies, recyclers, collectors, and even governments. Uh, and this group represents more than 40% of the uh, UK in terms of retail sales. So um, after that very quick uh, introduction and um, recap of SCAP, um, we'll look at uh, wet processing and some of the impacts associated with wet processing. So when we say wet processing, um, what we're really talking about is a textile process in which a product is treated through a liquid-based process. Um, this sounds quite straightforward, but um, as a matter of fact, it's, it's definitely more complicated than it seems. If you think about the um, supply chain, we have all of these different steps happening. We have farming, spinning, weaving and knitting, we have uh, cut, make, trim, um, before a product actually goes to a brand or a retailer. And within each of these um, steps, really, there are a number of different wet processing steps that could potentially be happening. Um, there may be um, washing and preparation treatments happening, um, dyeing can happen at a number of different stages, printing can happen, uh, garment finishing. So you really have all of these different processes happening in, in oftentimes um, repeated in multiple different stages. So it really is quite complicated when you zoom out a little bit. And then if you think of what, what processing really is, um, it's, it's tempting to think about um, you have a machine, and you put your product in and you put your chemicals in and then you get your product out and it's dyed and lovely and you get some wastewater out. But uh, even zooming into this level, it, it's much more complicated than that. You really need to think about um, all of the other sort of steps and processes that are happening alongside. So you have your dye stuff going in, you have your auxiliary chemicals going in, you have your substrate going in, but you also have this um, very relevant human element. So how in control are the people um, who are in charge of this process in terms of um, controlling the process? What's their quality control like? What are the facilities like? What are their the logistics like? Are they maintaining their machines? Are they properly trained on their machines? Are they um, using their machines in, in an optimized way and, and in an order that makes sense? Um, so very quickly it gets much more complicated than it first seems. So when we talk about wet processing and, and improving the situation, we really need to, to think about water and energy and chemicals. Um, and these are all relevant issues when we think about um, greenhouse gases, loss of biodiversity, rising sea levels, climate change, depletion of the ozone layer, and human health and wellness. Um, so with water, we really need to think about both consumption and pollution. So a lot of textile dyeing is occurring in regions where there is already severe water scarcity. And 
they also might be regions where there is weak legislation in terms of wastewater treatment. Um, and when we look at energy, we need to keep in mind that the textile industry is really one of the most inefficient industries when it comes to energy use. And this is largely because a lot of the machines being used are quite old and quite poorly maintained. Um, another thing we need to think about is chemicals. So there are over 2,000 different chemicals being used in the textile industry. And they're often being used in combinations or um, entering uh, water streams in combinations that haven't been fully researched and the impacts are not really understood. Um, when we think about chemicals, I think another thing we really need to mention is the Greenpeace Detox Campaign. Uh, I imagine that many of you on this call are, are familiar with the campaign, which is really about um, pressuring brands to achieve zero discharge of hazardous chemicals by 2020. So they, they've really put this chemical issue on the map. And so those are really some of the, the things we need to think about when, when we think about the impact of wet processing and why this is something that brands really need to take seriously and start to address and understand. Um, so we'll dive into some of these um, techniques, uh, starting with denim. So denim is really a great place to start. There's a lot of room for improvement within denim, and there's also a lot of innovation happening. Um, but if we look at this, this quote, one pair of Levi's 501s requires almost 3,480 liters of water, 400 megajoules of energy, and expels 32 kilos of carbon dioxide. This is equivalent to running a garden hose for 106 minutes, driving 125 kilometers, and powering a computer for 556 hours. So these statistics actually come from Levi's and an LCA they did on their own uh, denim production. So denim overall is a very resource intensive product. The dyeing process is hugely inefficient. Um, and then the processing and finishing that happen afterwards um, can be really extensive with 20 different steps to get that sort of aged and worn in look, which then of course ultimately weakens the product and reduces its lifespan. Um, denim has also been in the press quite a bit for uh, safety concerns when we think about sandblasting. Um, but there are also a, a number of other things that are concerning. Uh, for example, um, potassium permanganate spraying and other chemical issues. Uh, so it's really a great place to start thinking about optimizing. Um, so conventional denim dyeing is based on indigo, which traditionally comes from the wood plant. Um, one thing that people don't often think about is that this natural um, indigo dye was actually replaced by synthetic indigo um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, these are actually chemically identical, these two different dyes, um, but the synthetic indigo is based on a non-renewable resource. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and the fact is, whether you're using plant-based indigo or this uh, synthetic indigo, Either way, it's a very inefficient uh, dyeing process requiring massive amounts of water and energy. Um, the main issue is that indigo doesn't dissolve in water, and so it needs to be chemically uh, treated to make it soluble. And then uh, the denim or the yarns need to be repeatedly dipped in heated water baths uh, over and over to start picking up the color and start developing that, that blue color we associate with denim. So in some cases, you can see machinery a half a mile long of just dipping and dipping and dipping to get that color build up. So one of the innovations that we wanted to talk about was advanced denim uh, from Archroma. So they really take kind of a two-step approach to optimizing their denim uh, dyeing. And one is that they have uh, replaced the indigo with a dye that's a sulfur-based dye called thyrosyl. Um, and they're able to achieve indigo color ranges as well as uh, burgundies, greens, browns, other colors um, beyond the blue family. Um, and then in addition to switching up the dye stuff, they've also optimized the process so that you're reducing the number of dips in a, in a water bath with the dye. And the reason that they can do that is this uh, sulfur-based dye has a much greater affinity for the cotton than um, the indigo has. So it's, it's sort of a, uh, a double whammy in terms of making it more efficient. Um, according to the studies that they've done, um, advanced denim can reduce water use in the dyeing stage by up to 92 percent 
and can reduce cotton waste by 87%. This is because uh, when you think about all of the different re repeated dips that the yarn needs to go through, uh, at each stage you're kind of losing a bit of that cotton and a bit of that fuzz is getting stuck on the machinery. Um, so the fewer dips you have, the, the, f the less waste you have as well. Um, and their um, research has indicated that they can also uh, reduce energy use by about 30% compared to conventional indigo dyeing. I think another interesting thing about uh, our chroma and advanced denim is that they actually put together their own line of denim products and got it EU Eco Label certified just to show that that's something that's possible, uh, really showing the, the efficiency within their process. Um, in addition to dyeing, I think it's also really important to have a look at denim finishing. Um, this is an area where there's a huge opportunity for reducing water, waste, and carbon. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's not unusual for denim garments to undergo 20 or more different finishing steps um, with rinsing in between different, uh, different processes. So it's a, really a huge area for optimizing. And there's a lot of really interesting innovation going on in this area as well. Uh, so for example, um, laser technology, uh, which can be used to, to get kind of those whispering, whiskering or chevron effects um, or fading or patterns. Um, and an interesting thing about laser is that it really has opened up kind of this whole new area of um, creativity. So you can achieve different looks with laser that you can't achieve with anything else. Um, you can have uh, clients come in, purchase a pair of jeans and laser their own name into them if, if you want. Uh, I've seen uh, brands doing that. I've seen brands do nearly photorealistic images with the laser um, etched into their denim. So really interesting things you can do with laser technology. Another one is ozone. Um, an interesting kind of backstory to ozone is that these machines were actually used in hospitals to sterilize um, sheets and bedding and uniforms. And then it was discovered that the uh, the sterilizing process also gave it this really kind of soft, worn, vintage look um, without impacting the strength of the garment. So the uh, ozone has then been adopted in the, uh, the clothing industry and is being used to achieve those kind of vintage-y, um, aged looks. Another interesting one is enzyme processing. So you can use uh, cellulose enzymes, cellulase enzymes, excuse me, um, to kind of eat away at the fabric and give it that really worn in frayed look. There are also enzymes that um, just attack the, the indigo itself. Um, so really preserving the strength of the material but um, lightening the color. And there, there are a lot of really interesting things you can do with enzymes. Um, and in most cases, they can replace harsh chemicals like chlorine bleaches. And uh, a great thing about the enzymes is that you can also combine them with, uh, with other steps. So they don't need their own water bath. They don't need their own separate step. You can kind of pop them into uh, to existing steps that are already happening. Um, ice blast is another really interesting one. This is uh, using frozen CO2 pellets um, to, to uh, mimic sand blasting looks. Um, and another one is a, a new machine from Genealogia, the company that you see on the, uh, the slide in front of you. And uh, they've come up with something called eFlow, where they're using tiny bubbles uh, rather than water to carry um, different processes, whether that's um, resin application or softener application onto your product. Um, so replacing all that water with bubbles. Um, and then, of course, there's been kind of a resurgence in uh, raw denim, which is a, an unfinished and um, uh, generally much more longer-lasting product. Okay. And if anybody has questions on, uh, on the denim dyeing or the denim finishing or any of the other things that we have talked about so far, um, please do feel free to, uh, to let me know. Um, we'll also have some time at the end to, uh, to discuss. Okay, so we'll take a few minutes and look at uh, these lower impact cellulosic dyes. So most cotton is dyed using reactive dye, which uses huge quantities of water and uh, energy, as well as salt. Um, the salt is used to really fix the dye to the fiber. And salt usage uh, for reactive dyeing is up to about 20 billion pounds a year. So that's about half a million shipping containers full of salt. And you might not think of salt as a 
dangerous chemical. Um, but if you think about what would happen if you dumped a shipping container full of salt into a freshwater pond, you kind of get the, the picture of what the concern is around all of this salt use. Um, so the conventional cellulosic dyes tend to be really inefficient. Um, there's a lot of dye that doesn't end up being fixed to the fibers, so it's just sort of floating around that needs to be rinsed out, and that needs to often happen with hot water. So you have energy going into heating these water baths, and then repeated rinsing cycles using a considerable amount of water. And then you end up with wastewater that's really contaminated with leftover dye and with salt. And those two things are very difficult to treat and to clean out of wastewater. So higher fixation reactive dyes, which are these lower impact cellulosic dyes, uh, have been modified so that essentially they have more um, places where they can bind to the fiber. Um, so you're able to use less dye, less water, and less energy, and fewer chemicals. And that's really because the dye is able to stick much better. So you need much, uh, much less rinsing following the dyeing process. So products by Huntsman and Dye Star are really good examples of these lower impact cellulosic dyes. So Avatera is a, a particular one from um, Huntsman. And according to their studies, you can save 50% um, or more in terms of water and energy and reduce CO2 emissions by 50% or more um, compared to conventional dyeing and washing off processes. Um, another uh, helpful thing about these higher fixation reactive dyes is that you can actually reduce your processing time, um, in this case by about 25%. And you can do that without any major investment in new machinery or new processes, really in just switching your, your dye stuffs. And with this new dye technology, about 1.3 liters of fresh water per person per day could potentially be saved. Um, in major Asian textile producing countries, such as China, India, and Bangladesh. So quite significant savings for a very simple switch. Um, the Sara Eco Wash uh, is another product to know about. Uh, this one is from Dye Star. And it can be used in combination with these higher fixation reactive dyes to make the post-dye rinsing process more efficient and further reducing water energy and time needed. So what this table is showing is an example from Huntsman of a particular mill that they worked with in Asia to first optimize the recipes and the processes and then switch to a higher fixation reactive dye. So Huntsman estimates that this would achieve savings of about 62% in terms of carbon and water. Um, I think another thing that, that this table really brings up to me, where I, I think it's important to to discuss is really that there's a lot of room really in optimizing these processes. Um, so by fixing leaking pipes, having a good color management strategy, uh, maintaining your machinery, standardizing recipes, um, doing kind of those good housekeeping types of, uh, of tasks that you might think are happening anyway but likely aren't, um, there's a lot of savings to be made. Um, and this is really before any investment is made in new machinery or in um, switching to a new kind of dye stuff. So it's, it's really something to think about, that there's kind of this low-hanging fruit um, around uh, good housekeeping and optimization. And then when you add the newer dye stuff on top of that, there's really a, a huge savings potential. OK, we will take a quick look here at uh, waterless dyeing as well. Um, this is really a, a new technology. Uh, it's, a, it's a very exciting development, but it is quite niche at the moment. Um, Nike and Adidas are using the technology, but it's not yet widely available. Uh, there are a couple of companies working on this, and it's really about substituting water for uh, pressurized CO2, or a gas state dye. So Air Dye is one of the companies behind this technology. Um, and these, these waterless applications are so efficient because they don't require water to carry the dye. Uh, they don't require post-treatments, and the color is also maintained better during the life of the garment. Um, another interesting thing is that color corrections can be done quite simply. Um, it's not a full 
um, additional dyeing process if you need to make the shade just a little bit darker. It, it's, a, it's a much easier kind of small tweak can be done quite easily. Um, so Color Up, uh, which is a company in the US, published a life cycle assessment of um, air dye technology. And what this slide is showing is that air dye achieved 60 to 80 percent savings in carbon emissions and 29 to 95 percent savings in water when compared to current best practice, so not even current um, unoptimized practice. Uh, the reason it's 29 to 95 percent really has to do with um, how the dye is applied and whether it's a solid color. Um, and, and that's, of course, where more savings will be made. So you can see, very exciting, uh, the possibilities of using this technology, um, even though it's not something that's widely available just yet. Uh, Dyco is the other company behind the waterless dyeing technology, and they're partnering with Huntsman to really look at new uh, dyes and new chemical auxiliaries to go along with this technology. So Dyco's process uses a pressurized CO2 to carry the dye. Um, and then about 95% of that CO2 is recycled. Um, I think another thing that's really important to understand about the CO2 dyeing and the waterless dyeing is that this technology is only applicable to synthetic fibers at this point. Uh, we're probably about another 8 to 10 years away from waterless dyeing for cellulose. Um, so it's something to keep your eye on um, in terms of kind of the horizon, uh, but, but for now it is, it is quite an emerging technology, but very exciting um, and definitely being taken up by the larger brands, generally the sportswear brands. Okay, we'll spend uh, a little bit of time looking at solution dyeing as well. So solution dyeing is uh, also known as dope dyeing. So that might be a name that sounds more familiar to some of you on the line. Um, essentially, in this process, the color is added prior to extruding um, the synthetic fibers. So they're extruded with their final color. Um, and in that way, there isn't a separate dyeing step required. Um, the trick with this process is that color options tend to be limited and the color really needs to be determined at a very early stage. Uh, so this option makes sense when you think about using stock colors or if there are standard colors that your brand consistently uses that you can purchase in high volumes, this is a great option. Um, alternatively, brands can consider kind of collaborating with one another to purchase higher volumes. Um, so this is a, a process that really needs some advanced planning in order to uh, integrate it, but uh, the impacts are quite significant. So what we're looking at here is um, that the solution dyeing can kind of replace about 11% of the carbon footprint uh, that's normally coming from um, yarn dyeing. Um, so by skipping that full yarn dyeing step, um, it's, it's a much more efficient process. Um, there, there still needs to be a full life cycle assessment done to really understand, um, but essentially you're cutting out that entire step. Um, so you can see kind of removing that piece of the pie. And when we think about the sweat processing and the, uh, the impacts and where we can really make a difference, I think it, it kind of boils down to three major takeaways. And one is about knowing your product. And when I say know your product, what I mean is, do you know what your processes are? Do you know what the impacts of those processes are? Um, what are the implications of making a decision, uh, whether it's sort of a design-based decision or a cost-based decision? What are the pros and cons, um, when we think environmentally, um, of making those decisions? And what might the alternatives be? I also think it's really important to know your supply chain. So, who are your key suppliers? And who is actually doing your dyeing and finishing? Um, is it somebody who is um, integrated within your CMT? Is it a tier two? Is it way farther down you have no idea? These are really um, things that need to be understood. Um, and when you know who is doing your dyeing and finishing, you can also find out what are their capabilities. Um, it may turn out that they have uh, ozone machines sitting right there and are happy to use them on your denim, but you've never asked. Um, and another thing that I think is really important is really about developing a common language with your suppliers. Um, 
it's quite interesting at times. You may think you're, you're talking about the same process, but you have one name for it and they have another name for it. And it seems like you're having a conversation, but really talking past one another. So that's something else to really keep in mind. And then this third one is about considered decision making. Um, so are key people on board um, with making these changes and achieving these um, impact reductions? Um, are designers and product developers educated? Do they know the impacts of their decisions? And are people ready to take charge of those decisions and really be intentional about it? Now, of course, um, not all decisions can be made based on sustainability impact, but it's about um, considering the trade-offs and being aware of the implications of the decisions that you make. Um, so as kind of a final step, uh, I wanted to share with you a tool that Maybuy has recently released. This is our wet processing benchmark. Uh, you may be familiar with the fiber benchmark and social benchmarks that we've put together. This one is really about illustrating the water and energy and chemical impacts of common wet processing techniques. Um, so we look at pretreatment, at dyeing, at garment finishing, and at printing. And uh, what you see here is, um, in the blue line, the actual range of water usage that mills are achieving for that particular process. And the gray line shows you the actual range of energy usage that uh, mills are achieving for that particular process. And then we have sort of this color-coded explanation of the chemicals involved. Uh, so this is available on our website. Um, please feel free to have a look, see if it's useful for you, and of course reach out with uh, any questions you might have for us. So thank you all for uh, joining us, and if you do have questions, of course uh, feel free to reach out and uh, let us know. And uh, thanks for joining our webinar, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.